Oh, welcome back to another video on uh, creating elements in Rhino inside Revit. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at ways of creating native Revit elements uh, using Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, the reason that uh, this is, is so important is that native elements tend to work the best in Revit uh, in the in the long term in terms of projects in the BIM schema. Um, there's ways to there's a lot of ways for people to graphically control how they look, uh, add materials, add additional BIM shared parameters to them to the native objects, and they can also uh, because they're driven by Revit, uh, uh, man, many of those parameters can be dy dynamic based on the actual size of the objects. Um, another thing that's nice is that native Rev elements very much uh, can be edited very often, I should say, can be edited using uh, Revit after they've been disconnected from Rhino. And uh, t dimensions can be attached to them, and they can host other objects. Uh, and many times, uh, Revit users downstream may not even realize that uh, these elements were created in Rhino and Grasshopper, and that's always a good thing uh, is in terms of the smooth uh, transition of the project uh, t into more and more detail closer to drawing sets and things like that. So let's take a look at, at this project and, and see uh, see what it looks like. So what we have here is a, um, a Rhino model. And uh, and you'll see here that, that it's a building. The central building is what we're going to be working on a little bit here. It's got an unusual facade. It's got a few floors. It's got a walkway in the front here with some columns that, that you can't see yet. One of the things to understand is when you're creating Revit native elements, many times you're not going to take the whole of the Rhino geometry. You're just going to take a piece of the Rhino geometry to drive whatever uh, component in, in Revit's going to create those objects. And so it takes a little bit of planning, a little understanding what Revit wants, and, and many times you're extracting just a portion of the geometry out of, out of Rhino and then, and then using that to dynamically uh, drive the objects in, in Revit. Another thing that, that uh, is nice about this is you're going to see that when you hook this up um, this direction, many times Grasshopper can dynamically drive uh, these elements if you'd like. And, and so we're going to look a little bit about that right here. Uh, so let's jump into the uh, Grasshopper definition. And if I go to Grasshopper and Revit, I get my Revit toolbars, of course. And, and over here is where many of the add tools are, uh, adding new components. This will change as time goes on as we add more. Uh, but for right now, we have just a few. And so we're going to use a few of these to um, drive the, the parts and pieces. Um, so let's look at this first definition here. Uh, it's important to understand that I'm using a plugin for Grasshopper called Elephant, and the reason is it's got some nice tools to grab objects off layers, filter for them, grab information off them, and things like that. So, so in this case, I'm grabbing everything on the floor curves la layer. So you see, we have a floor curves layer here that just has these curves on it, and uh, and and off the roof layer in this case. So both layers, and then and then I'm getting the name of those objects off there. And what we're doing is, is I'm actually, this is a very interesting one. I, I have the curves, and I find the elevation of the curve by grabbing the first point. And then I feed that actually into a level. So now I'm going to create levels, native Revit levels, in Rhino. And I create, you take the name off the curve, too, and that will become the name of the levels. In addition, I take those original curves... And I'll throw these in this in this uh, the floor by boundary uh, object, which are, or component which I've created here. Another thing which I've done, and and this is uh, we we do this quite often, is I'll take some inputs. Uh, in this case, I took the uh, model category picker, right? So I can create uh, I can find categories, and then I also took the uh, element type picker. This allows me to to pick a category and then push it into here and then all the types that are available in that category I can pick from. And uh, and because we're going to create a floor, I, I selected floor here and then I selected one of the uh, native types that are in this drawing, uh, in this case uh, generic 12 inch. 
Uh, and um, and so that goes in the type of this. Let me let me just create this here. I'll enable this component. We'll do a, a recompute here. And so now if we look inside Revit, you will see that we now have uh, new levels, and these levels are named what the floors were named. Floor 1, Floor 2, Floor 3, Floor 4. Floor 4, uh, Rhino created those, but they're native Revit uh, levels. We also have uh, the floors hosted on those levels, by the way. So if I change one of these levels, the floors will update. Uh, one of these floors, that floor is also named the same in this case. Um, and uh, and so you can see what we did was was create the levels, create the floors hosted on those levels. These are true native elements. So one of the ways we can now we can edit this and and the way uh, that we can do that the way you do that with with objects uh, native objects created in in Ry or Revit with Rhino is um, you can pick on it here and the first thing I do is unpick it and that essentially releases this uh, from Grasshopper and and so once it's released I can do whatever I want to because it's a native object I'm going to go through here and I'm going to edit the boundary. In this case, uh, and you can see here that uh, that it, this has a distance now. Uh, so let's just say 15 feet, and you can see when I do that, it actually changed the boundary here. I'll press, uh, you know, enter. Uh, let's finish that, and now you can see that that change actually happened in uh, Revit, and so I'm able to edit this boundary as you would be able to edit this boundary in. Uh, Revit. Uh, one of the interesting parts about this, if I want to give this floor back to Rhino uh, or in Grasshopper back control, all I need to do is repin it. And now uh, when Grasshopper updates, this floor will go and uh, update again. So pinning and unpinning are the ways to release uh, objects from Grasshopper on the fly. So there we have some floors, we have some levels with those floors hosted on there. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is this little walkway here, the columns for this little walkway. Uh, so I'm going to bring up, um, again, bring up Rhino and Grasshopper, and you can see I have a series of points here. Those points have some vertical curves, which is uh, what it takes to uh, to create um, some vertical curves, which what is create some columns. So uh, we take the B rep, which is the that ceiling there, and um, we create some points and we create some vertical lines. And so now I have some columns, some round columns in this case, and I'm going to uh, push that those lines into that column, do a recompute here. And uh, what you'll see is in Revit is now I have columns uh, as part of, of the definition. These are native columns. Later I can go through and I can edit their profile. I can change their height, things like that. Um, but what's interesting too is that because we're in Rhino and Grasshopper is driving this, I can come in here and I will just uh, move this roof here. And you can see that the columns actually are updating based on the height of the roof that I have. So now I have Grasshopper dynamically changing the column height here. And uh, so that's something that we can do every time I, I change uh, this, the height of this BREP, it finds the bounding box, goes through and finds the height, things like that. So there's the second way of, of uh, or second type of, of adding uh, objects that are dynamically controlled in this case. All right. The last part of this definition is probably the most complex, but it's not bad. Uh, and we'll go in here, and this happens to do, has to do with the unusual little facade here, this little curved facade, and uh, in in uh, Rhino. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create um, the grid in Rhino, uh, and then I'm going to use adaptive components, and I'm going to place adaptive components along this using Grasshopper. Uh, and those adaptive components are native uh, Revit uh, adaptive components. But what's different here is that I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use uh, Rhino and Grasshopper to randomly seed two different kinds of components across this facade. And we'll be able to quickly change between a few different design options um, to see how that works. Uh, so if I go in here and uh, we'll just... Uh, how this works, by the way, is, is I used a paneling tools plugin to create a grid on the objects. 
uh, I take the, that grid, I'm going to push all those points for each one of those, uh, you know, each one of those cells to here. Then I'm also going to come down here and randomly select between two families, in this case, uh, frame panel and frame panel 001. Uh, each one's just a little different. I'm going to randomly pick between the two and I'm going to feed that into the adaptive component creator. Uh, so we'll enable this. It takes a minute to place all the adaptive components. You can see them in, in uh, Rhino here. But more importantly, you can see them here in uh, Revit. So these are actual uh, adaptive components. If I was to disconnect uh, Rev, uh, Rhino, you know, they'd still be here, still uh, schedule and draw just like you'd expect from adaptive components. Now, what's interesting here is uh, because this is uh, driven by Grasshopper, uh, I can... Um, I can go in here and I can actually change the random seed here. Uh, let's just uh, slide this over from 0 to 1. You can see it changed the uh, pattern there. So I have different patterns that I can pick from uh, depending on which pattern I want. Uh, the other thing is because of the way Grasshopper Random works, when I come back to the same seed, I actually will get the same pattern. So you can go through this, and you, while you can create many patterns, you can also go through and uh, repeat the, the, go back to a specific pattern that you may or may not have liked. And uh, we could do this with attractors. We could do this, uh, you know, based, uh, for instance, we could do this with uh, sunshades based on time of day. Any way that you want to uh, dynamically drive these, you can do that with Grasshopper, but they're native Revit elements. And so uh, there's a lot of things that, that, that people like to do um, where you're, you're trying to make, have Grasshopper make a lot of decisions or, or adapt to a local situation um, that, that works quite well with, with Grasshopper. So, so today, uh, just to review a little of what we looked at here, we looked at a few different ways to um, create native Revit elements, why we might do it, the fact that they're native, that they work w really well in a BIM schema, especially le in later in the project when, when you need native Revit elements and lots of people are, are editing and changing the model. Uh, we, we created floors um, that later we could edit the, the boundary of. Uh, we created dynamic columns that adapted to the change in, in our, in our, um, our uh, walkway design. Yet when we disconnect Rhino, we can, we can change all those columns because they're native uh, in Revit. And the last thing that we did is populate a facade with a bunch of uh, random adaptive components based on, in this case, complete randomness, but we could have done it uh, you know, based on many other kinds of, of algorithmic uh, design um, requirements. So uh, hopefully this is helpful, uh, and, and this kind of completes our our three-part series on creating Rhino uh, elements and Revit elements in Revit with uh, Rhino geometry. Uh, thank you.